Hey guys, welcome to the Wall Builders Library. Uh, this week, Jonathan and I are going to get into the American Revolution. Which and... is, right, kind of our favorite part of American history. It's kind of why we're here. A lot of what we're doing, kind <laughs> yeah. of trying to capture and learn more the about The founding that. era, very much part of what we do and spend time with. Uh, one of the things we enjoy a lot, not just because we're Texans, although it probably helps, is guns. Um, yeah. but might be the case that we are carrying right now, which is totally legal in Texas. We have our licenses. We actually train a lot. We love guns. I'm so glad for the guns we have now as opposed to the guns that used to be used back. So uh, these, yeah. are, these are our muskets, largely from the American Revolution. And actually, I'll start with this yeah. one. This is a brown bess. On the back, you see there is the king's seal. And if you look, it's got GR printed underneath it. So you've got the crown, GR, GR stands for the Latin, Georgius Rex, which is just King George, but it's in Latin because that's cool. And we just call them King George, no Georgius yeah. Rex. That's, a, that's too much. On the back, it also is Tower for Tower of London. Um, on these guns, these are anywhere between uh, the different muskets they would use anywhere from 50, 55, all the way up to 80 plus caliber guns. So the way this would work is you would have a powder horn, you pour Which your powder actually in. actually have one right here. This is one from the Revolutionary War period. So you've got a little wooden peg in. That would come out. You would pour in however much powder you need. And then... So yeah, you're going to drop in your ball. You have wadding. You take out the ramrod. You're going to pack it all down. And once you get that in, you're going to open up the flash pan. Right now we're on half cock. You pour some powder in the flash pan. There's a very small hole in the side. The idea is that when you close the flash pan, now the powder's in, you go to full cock, and then you get up so you can shoot the gun. And when you shoot it, the idea is that it drops a spark in the flash pan, it catches the powder there, the powder there, catches powder on the inside, and finally, we'll shoot the projectile. If you've ever shot a rifle or a long gun, you know generally when you shoot, you're gonna have it up, the stock up on your shoulder, you're gonna have your cheek down, and you're gonna look down the barrel, and you have a front sight. Well, that's how you would normally shoot, except this is not actually a front sight. That is a front post, and the front post was used more specifically for holding the bayonet in place. So the bayonet would go down, and this holds the bayonet in place from coming off. And you notice this is also a, a very large bayonet. Generally, there were two kinds of bayonets. This one had a blade on the side, had a very sharp point, so you could use it for stabbing forward and then this one right here is actually a triangular point which is specifically designed to make gaping wounds a triangular point is extremely hard to stitch up and treat especially with right last week we learned about some of the medical practices at the time just cut it off <laughs> amputate so yeah so one of the things too with the blade being on the side of this one you don't have a blade on the back side that way when you are loading with your ram rider <laughs> because your hand but the idea of a blade on the side was so that not only could you stick this forward, you also could swing down almost like this was a machete or something with people coming at you. So certainly not friendly or fun, but here's the point. The front post is now no longer really a sight. Can't see it at all. So you're looking down, and at this point, you're basically just yeah. pointing the gun. Well, how do you and aim? <laughs> when people would shoot, they also were worried back here where the flash pan is, because your face is close to where this powder is about to go off, if that goes off, that's not really good for your face or your eyes. So what was common is people would close their eyes or even turn their head to protect their face. So not only do you have not really a front sight anymore, you now are closing your eyes or turning your head, which part of European warfare allowed for this, because you'd right. have an entire army lined up in front of you. So really, just point the gun in that direction, close your eyes, pull the trigger, that was kind of the idea behind it. And beyond having now the musket and bayonet, there also, we have a couple of pistols. Yep, so we've got two right here. Also from around that Revolutionary War period, we have this one, which is still a flint lock. This one's missing the flint, but it's also kind of your concealed carry pistol. Uh, it's been kind of sawn off, and you can see you've got the metal plate at the end, but this would work exactly the same way as the musket. It's just a lot smaller. <laughs> But then this one over here, this is actually a dueling pistol, and it used to be flintlock, but if you can see right here, it's actually been changed to the later uh, technology, which is called cap and ball, or percussion cap, and there's uh, that, those were used for the most of the 1800s. 
But so also Alexander Hamilton, yep. right? Thinking duel. Alexander Hamilton, uh, Andrew Jackson, right? Absolutely. Uh, allegedly thought fought in over one hundred duels, or, or was second. Yeah, so he yeah, yeah. took part in. Um, and and also during the revolution, generally only officers would have had the pistols. Yep. And officers generally are going to be mounted. And part of <laughs> very good, right? Thanks. I'm, Thank you. I'm from Texas. Yeah. So also part of the reason for having a metal butt plate was after you're on a horse and you fired, you can't really necessarily reload while you're in the battle. So you just turn it over and kind of people's heads are right about the right spot and you have a good club. And this was for generally all of the muskets. Now, thinking, hang on, thinking of two pistols. Oh yeah. And, and a bayonet my and a musket. Favorite stories of all time comes from the first battle, the opening days of the American Revolution, and it's about a man by the name of Samuel Whitmore. Now, Samuel Whitmore, right, he lived uh, kind of around the Boston area, and right, you have Lexington, Concord, and then the march back to Boston with the British troops, about a column of 700 British soldiers going back to Boston, because right at, at Lexington, there's about 70 militiamen, then right. at Concord, there's about 300, but then everybody gets the news, and now there's about 2,000, several thousand at the very least, of American militiamen gathering to push back the British. So the British see this and they're like... And, and the several thousand didn't come together as a unit. No, so it wasn't it's several thousand, thousand all 700. Right, but, but. but thousands responded as they heard the word. Thousands responded, so it might be a couple dozen here and a couple dozen there and right, 30 or 40 here, or maybe five here, or maybe even just one somewhere along the way. So on the march back to Boston, the British are doing their, you know, typical British things, you know, tyranny and all that jazz. <laughs> they would go in, they would... You know, start burning some crops. They would be, you know, causing a lot of ruckus, as people would say. Uh, <laughs> I don't generally say ruckus, but no, that's fine. As ruckus. they would say, or, you know, whatever. But <laughs> one of the guys that lived on the road back to Boston, as I mentioned, Samuel Whitmore, he was a veteran of the French and Indian War, right, a couple of decades earlier. So he was an older man. He was actually about 80 years old at this time, but he hears what's going on, and he says, no. Nah. So he goes in, he grabs his two pistols, Dueling them, pistols. Dueling, because, right, you would have two of them. Um, loaded them, tucked them into his belt, grabbed his old saber, tucked that into his belt too, grabbed his musket, loaded it, stepped outside onto his front porch, sees the column of about 700 British marching by, takes charges at the British. I can only imagine, right, the British response. The first guy goes down, it's like, hey, you know, Craig, <laughs> did, you, just happened. Well, did you trip? <laughs> no, he's bleeding. Oh, he's dead. Second guy goes down. All right, something's going on. Third guy, they seize him. Uh, Samuel Whitmore now charging, you know, some white hair maybe flowing in the breeze at the brisk tempo. <laughs> and charging as an 80-year-old, yeah, right? I mean, whatever that means. It's relative. Walking um, quickly, we don't know. But the, the heart British, was there. <laughs> the British response... As he now has shot this third shot, he draws a saber. The British then turn, and, and there was a small attachment that kind of went his direction. And they open fire. One of the shots hits him in the face. In the face. Apparently right, knocks again, him back. Huge, a huge musket right, ball. These are big musket balls, but he didn't kill him. Knocks him on the ground, and so they charge, and with their bayonets, they stabbed him on the ground. Believed to be 13 times they stabbed him. And in the midst of this, right, you can imagine there's probably some kicking. They're probably using their butt of the gun and hitting him as well. And then they leave him for dead and they go on. Well, a couple hours later, after the British hours have now long later. gone, neighbors are now thinking, okay, the coast is clear. Let's get over. And, and maybe they started walking earlier, but it was several miles. Because we do know the neighbors apparently live several miles away. When they get there, they find Samuel Whittemore... Not only is he still alive, the report was he was trying to reload one of his guns because apparently he was not done with the fight. He wants more of the British. He recovered and lived to be 98 years old before he finally died. You can look up some more of his story oh, online. My gosh. But just absolutely remarkable. Yeah, this no is, wonder why we won. <laughs> when you have guys like yeah. that, certainly tough guys. But this is something when you look back, uh, the, the fighting was a lot different certainly so than different. warfare today. In fact, one of the things for people, if you've seen the movie The Patriot, the most iconic scene from The Patriot involves something like this. These are actual tomahawks from the revolution. Now, this one Even looks, this one. <laughs> yeah, this one looks more like Viking era, but no, this was a battle, a war tomahawk from I mean, the revolution. If, if you're ever able to visit, come on a tour and stuff like that, you'll you'll get to hold this one. And I mean, this one just, you, you hold it, and I mean... It just feels very, very visceral. It's like, okay. <laughs> and, right, you can imagine for these to be effective, it's very close range, it's very messy, 
and, and, and sometimes people get a glamorized perspective of yep. war of the battlefield, and there's nothing glamorous about no. how these would have been used, how messy, how bloody. Uh, this would obviously have been a very tough situation. Well, speaking of messy and bloody, <laughs> also one of the things, again, if you've seen the movie The Patriots, there's a couple of scenes where you see cannonballs, and cannonballs that are bouncing. We have a cannonball. One is American and one is British. Now, you know, if you were here, we'd ask you which one it is. So leave your, leave your comment on which one you think. Which one is British? Which one is American? I'll give you a few seconds. You can shout it out loud. <laughs> um, raise your hand in your classroom. Right, Mom, I know that one. Okay, good. Yeah, so, that's correct. Which one this would it be? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I'll go ahead and tell you the answer. Uh, this is the English one, while this is the American one. Now, how would you be able to tell? We can tell because this one's really ugly, but this one's very nice and shiny. Over there, coming uh, all the way over from England to get here. They have a lot of time, and they've also been producing arms and munitions for hundreds of years. They have this down to a science. This one would be extremely accurate, and also the weight would be equal throughout all of the, the different cannonballs, so they would have production methods down to where no matter what, you would always know, all right, if I put in this much charge, it will get this far. The Americans are just trying to get something to shoot back, so they are not able to take yeah, the you time. Can, you can see where the mold is around it. You can yep. see where the pour was, so where they would have poured into the cast of the mold, where they break it loose. And generally, you would want to smooth this down because if you shoot a deformed bullet, the bullet's not going to go the direction you're aiming. Again, if you're aiming at a line of people, it's probably relatively okay because if it goes <laughs> a little right or left, you're still probably hitting somebody. But even the idea of bouncing was yep. Fair. Yeah, because these right here, these are solid. They don't blow up. So, you know, whatever you see in the movies, these don't blow up. These are pure blunt force, you know, trauma. And what they would do is they would actually bounce these across the ground. They would skip them across the ground instead of doing just the straight lob shot because the idea is as it's skipping through, it's going through rank and file of troops. Because, right, men back then were actually quite a bit smaller than we are today. We're both about six foot. That's about average. Back then, the average was dramatically shorter. It was. I mean, it's about five one, five four, five six. The estimates were generally five one to five four during the Revolution. George Washington was described as being a head and shoulders above everybody else. He was roughly six three on his deathbed, and so for him to be a head and shoulders, <laughs> I mean, that six three is not that much taller than us. Yeah. But if you're only 5'1 to 5'4, that's a lot oh taller. Gosh. And so the idea was they could get more casualty right. out of a bouncing cannonball because it hits and bounces yeah. off people. If this hits any part of you, very right, destructive. That part of you is not a part of you anymore. <laughs> Which no. also speaks to the fact that if you see a movie where there's exploding cannonballs from the Revolution or before, that's inaccurate the way they present that. Now, things that did explode are something like this. This right here, you can see it kind of looks very similar, but this is a lot lighter. It's actually hollow. You can maybe hear that sound. It's hollow on the inside because this is a hand grenade from the Revolutionary War. Now, when I think about the Revolutionary War, I am not thinking of hand grenades. It was a pretty new technology. And in fact, this right here is a mortar shell. You can see it kind of looks similar. It's the same principle. What it is, is you would fill it up with gunpowder. On this one, several pounds. And this one, not as much, obviously. And then you would put a little wick in it. Typically a, a piece of cloth, something along that line. And then you would put a cork in it. And then at that point, you would light the wick, you would probably say a brief prayer, and then you would get it as far away from you as possible. And then the idea is, is that it will explode, it will fragment, very similar to, you know, our idea of the hand grenade today. And, but, and with the mortar, right, if you remember Francis Scott Key, the Star Spangled yep. Banner talks about the bombs bursting in air. These are the kind of bombs that burst in air. And so this is different than a cannonball because you're not shooting it on the ground in front of people. The idea of a mortar was to blow it up in the air above them and throw shrapnel down on them. This was a small mortar. Eight it, inches. It'd get about twice this size. And on those, you would have, sometimes they would put these little handles on them so the guys can team up and, and really carry and it. And to clarify, but, the small mortar, this is 43 pounds. Unloaded. So, it would be even heavier. When this is loaded. this is a very heavy mortar, and this is the small mortar they had much larger. And, and we have more things related. And that's to actually from the Battle of Yorktown, by the way. So that's from the last Battle of the Revolutionary War, which was primarily an artillery engagement. You did have some troop to troop combat, right? The storming of the redoubts with uh, Lafayette and Hamilton, but most of that battle was actually fought through all artillery, and that's one of the surviving pieces. Yeah. And the same thing with the cannonballs. Those actually came from battlefields. We have all the information, the credentials of what battlefields they came from. So all of this stuff 
is, as we're showing you, is from a revolution period. Um, we have certificates of all that. So this is something, as we look back revolution, um, the, the whole idea of warfare is very different than we think. But let's go back now in a different direction because one of the things today, when people talk about the revolution, um, there was a new project that came out yeah, right, right just out. last year, the, the 1619 Project. New York that said Times. the reason that the the founding fathers largely wanted to fight the revolution was to protect slavery. Now, yeah. what proof can you offer for that? Well, very little, because that really is not a substantial reason at all. In fact, if you go back and read the Declaration, that's where you find out they give 27 reasons why they actually wanted to separate from Great Britain. This and, is not the original Declaration, but it's pretty good. <laughs> it's so, what it would have looked like. So yeah, of the one that they would have printed and sent to different states, this is a copy made from one of those early declarations that would have been sent to the states to let the American people, the, the colonists know this is what we are doing. And so we listed 27 grievances. The, the one grievance that most people know today... Taxation without representation. Yes. yes there it is. It's on. <laughs> Which is on the list, but it's number, it's number 17 out of 27. And actually, it's the only one that expressly deals with economics. What you find the most are things that deal with legislative abuses, that deal with judicial abuses, um, that, that deal um, with yep. a lot of representation kind of issues. But in the midst of that, even back up to like the 1619 Project, if you go back and read the original draft of the Declaration, so Jefferson's Which? original draft... This right here, this is an early edition of the writings of Thomas Jefferson. And what really separated this away from a lot of the other kind of things coming out of the time is it actually includes in it uh, a facsimile of Thomas Jefferson's handwritten draft of the Declaration of Independence. Now, it's four pages long, but we're going to go ahead and open it up to pages three and four, and we're being really careful with yeah, it. Yeah, it is really delicate. It's already tearing in some places, which is just the nature of dealing with really old documents. And we don't open And we this. didn't tear it. <laughs> no. We don't open this often, um, but for you guys to see, it is definitely worth seeing. What's significant, when Jefferson did the original draft of the Declaration, the longest grievance he had listed is down here. Starts here. And it almost takes up the entire page. What he, what he identifies in this long grievance is that Jefferson says that the king has uh, imprisoned and oppressed people in a far off land and brought them to America and made them slaves and we've tried to free them and he wouldn't let us. And Jefferson actually puts a very long anti-slavery grievance in there. And you, where, can, you can read this all online. It's available online. I've never been in a class in both my undergrad and even postgraduate course that even talks about Jefferson's first draft. Um, and, and in this, Jefferson calls all of the African slaves, yeah, he calls well, them men. Yeah, we can just read it. Um, let's see. So it starts up here, but he gets into it and he says, right, the king has incurred miserable death in their transportation thither. This piratical warfare, the opprobrium of infidel powers, is the warfare of the Christian king of that's Great like Britain. That's like putting quotations, right? Yeah, like calling that's not him out really here, what a Christian does. Determined to keep open a market where men should be bought and sold. And so, right, this is really interesting because if you can see, men is in all caps. The only other words which Jefferson put in all caps was the title, United States of America. Um, outside of that, he saved this for only this word because Jefferson, right, there's a lot of things that, that are said about Jefferson. One of them is that, you know, right, he's super racist, racist and things. Right. He didn't think that slaves or African Americans were men. And in fact, I have even heard it said, right, that... Uh, that uh, actually this even says it more or less that in the declaration right the all men are created equal well they didn't really mean men they meant like white men yeah. not different nationalities or races and again you go back to jefferson's original draft and it's very different and actually so, so that didn't appear in the final draft of the declaration mm -hmm. um jefferson in his own writings laments that there were s several southern states that opposed that because they weren't trying to end slavery in their states they wanted to preserve yeah. slavery and Jefferson not only laments that the southern states felt that way, he and then... even out of that, in Jefferson's writing, and there's some disagreement, but Jefferson only lists two states who voted against it. Now, for anything to get included into the Declaration, it had to be unanimous, but two out of the 13 states at that point that are voting on this, that means the majority of the states actually said, yes, we want this in the Declaration. Two of them, I think it's Georgia and South Carolina... Correct, were the two. ...voted against it and kept it out, but... 
Yeah, 11 of them saying, yes, we want that in. Right, and this is, this is again, where it's significant to go back and see why did we really separate it. We're going to spend some time this week going through some of the people involved, uh, going through where a lot of these ideas came from, because even though Jefferson writes this, all of these ideas are not unique to Jefferson. Jefferson is actually kind of yeah. rewording some ideas that have been around for a while. And we'll talk about where did those ideas come from, who promoted this first. A lot of really interesting stuff. But here's the point. As you look at the American Revolution, there's a lot of stuff today that gets promoted that is simply not accurate when you go yeah. back and look at original documentation. It's not accurate if you look at the final wording of the Declaration. It's not accurate if you look at Jefferson's first draft of the Declaration. There were 27 reasons that the Founding Fathers agreed we should separate from Great Britain. Taxation was one of the 27, but it didn't, again, didn't have the majority of the mentions. There's a lot more involved, and most of what you find is they were frustrated with the king for abusing and removing rights that they believed were God-given rights, which you do see them outline in the Declaration, right? That we believe that we have inalienable rights that have come from a creator. And so they go through this list of where the king has abused, removed, taken away their God-given rights, and they're fighting to preserve those God-given rights was the idea behind this. Now, again, there's so many details involved in that. We're going to spend a little time this week trying to get into some of that, who yeah. were some of the key players involved. And then looking even at, at the 56 guys who ended up yeah. signing the declaration, um, some of the military leaders, the officers involved in the process. Certainly there's more than we can do on a Facebook Live series in just one week, but we do want to give you some details, especially based on original stuff. So we wanted to start with fun stuff, looking at some of the weapons of warfare, and then looking at, at some, getting, some declaration yeah, thoughts. And then get into even more fun stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. So hopefully you guys stay with us this week. We'll be going through a lot of stuff in this. If you have specific questions about the American Revolution that you want us to cover, uh, give us a comment. We'll try to respond to that. I did see a comment already uh, that somebody was asking where were a lot of these guns manufactured. So the Brown Best was originally manufactured over in England. That's that um, tower that it said Tower of London would, would have been the armory that it was. Correct. Now, it was, at that time, there were some people that could manufacture relatively in America, but it was generally a gun-by-gun -gun basis, so they didn't, we had the, didn't have the same production level. Um, so we tried to do things along the way. Actually, when we became allies with the French, we were then able to get some muskets from the French as well. Um, so there, there was Thanks, a lot guys. involved in the process. Yeah, we... Uh, we think we, uh, I was trying to use the we, I don't even know how to say that. Thank you. Uh, I don't even know a French accent. Can you pull a French accent? No, I can't. Okay. So not try. <laughs> if, if you can like even comment with a French accent, help us, we'll figure it out. But so yeah, a lot of the guns were, were British manufactured and then we got some from the French as well. We were able to do on a individual level, some here in America. Um, but, but certainly we didn't have production facilities at that time. Anyway, if you have questions along the way, let us know, post in the comments, uh, and we'll try to respond, but we're praying for you guys in the midst of this crisis. Yep. We are believing that God is going to help us through this, um, whether it's for your family, for your business, for what's going on. Um, and if you have a specific prayer request, uh, post in the comments because our staff, we still, uh, when we meet, we're praying together every morning and we will certainly be happy to pray for you and what's going on. But God bless you guys. We'll see you tomorrow.